presentation is personalized, flexible teaching. What is this image? My goodness, isn't this strange? I'm sure you're looking at this wondering what, you know, what this has to do with personalized, flexible teaching. Well, I kind of had a funny idea, and for those of you who have seen some of the some of the presentations that I've given before, uh, you know uh, you know that I often like to think about a metaphor. A metaphor is often a way of being able to remember things because it makes you think of something else. So you're you're trying to think of say what are some names for different colors? You think ah the rainbow of colors, and then you think of different ones there. So one idea helps you to think of other ideas. So I thought as a metaphor that I would use uh, today, I was thinking about the problems and the challenges that teachers face, and I was thinking especially that the problems that we face are often constraints. Constraints. What's a constraint? It's something that stops us, it stops us from moving freely. And often as teachers, we cannot move freely in our classrooms. Uh, we're stopped from doing what we think might be best. Why are we why are we stopped? Well, you know, there's many, there's many different issues, many things that stop us. Uh, a lot of them are sort of uh, we're constrained and by multiple problems that we are faced with, but also just things like certain policies, you know, deadlines, the time that we have uh, in the classroom, the differences in students, the differences in class sizes, and so on. So I'd like to talk about a number of those problems today and offer some very brief solutions and some ideas about how to do that. And also, uh, because Vince, uh, Pearson is sponsoring this, I'd also like to talk a little bit about a brand new textbook series called Startup, which I think is very, very good and answers, addresses a lot of the problems that I'm going to raise today. So let's begin and keep thinking about Harry Houdini. Interesting guy, he was born in Bucharest, Hungary. Uh, his family moved to Appleton, Wisconsin. Appleton, Wisconsin. He was very interested in card tricks and, and uh, he was very athletic when he was young and he, uh, he got into doing acrobatics and then eventually he became interested in uh, what he was, his specialty, which was breaking out of locks. So he learned how to open locks and different things and then he would be tied up and maybe put underwater or dug into a grave or something and he would have to unlock himself and find his way out. So this was uh, this was sort of uh, how he uh, how he became most famous basically for overcoming for overcoming constraints. So I'd like each of you to be a little bit like Harry Houdini after this hour and uh, think about the constraints that face you and how you might overcome them. So let's begin. So we can start with this question and if I was face to face with you, I would love to just, this is the point where I would sort of say, okay, take five minutes, talk to the person next to you. What are some problems that you face in the classroom? We can't do that, uh, although maybe you can do that if you're sitting next to one of your friends watching this. But generally, uh, what are the problems that you face in the classroom? I was thinking about this when I was putting this uh, um, PowerPoint together, the presentation together, and I was thinking about, well, what are some of the problems that I've faced in the classroom? Well, I think I think lots of times some of the greatest problems that I faced, and I started teaching, uh, I started teaching emotionally disturbed teenagers. That's what I first did. I did that for five years, and then then I was in prison. I <laughs> I was I wasn't the prisoner. I was the teacher, but I worked in a children's prison for a year and a half, and those children really really had problems. But many of the problems were the same. And they were the same that ones that I encountered once I started teaching university, and that is motivation. Motivation. How do you get students very motivated to learn in the classroom? How do you keep their attention? How do you make sure that they think it's useful? And 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 how do you get them to persevere, uh, to keep trying, to keep trying, even though they see something is so difficult to do? And learning a language is very difficult, and it's probably more difficult than almost any other skill in some ways. Why? Well, if you uh, if you listen to uh, if you play piano or something like that, you can practice your piano at home, and you can do that all day long. But if you really want to practice in learning English, you really have to speak to other people. 
in the language classroom, we spend so much time correcting students. Oh no, please don't say it this way. Say it this way, right? Oh no, I'm sorry. That's the wrong verb. Try again. So there's so much failure in a classroom. And of course that failure we know is necessary to learn, but it is challenging for the students. They, they find it very difficult. So there's lots of problems. So you know, I'm sure you're thinking about some of the problems that you're facing. And if you have other problems, that I don't mention today. You know, email me and maybe we can talk about it a bit more. I'm always interested in this sort of thing. So I'm, as I mentioned, I'm talking about this new series called Startup. So I'll use some examples from Startup later on. Can a new course help teachers and learners? Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, Pearson, uh, I've mentioned before, is, the, is uh, the largest publisher in the world, and it also has an enormous research arm. Uh, people don't know about this. They think they just make books, but well, of course, to make those books, they need to do a great deal of research, and they do that research by talking to teachers like you, trying to find out what works, what doesn't work, what they need, you know, what have they tried before. Uh, maybe what some teachers have tried that, oh, that's a good idea, and so on and so forth. And also what's what's important for today. Uh, one thing that we decided uh, was very important for today was communicating uh, online. So you see on this page, just at the bottom of the right, there's a little text uh, text message. And uh, that's a big part of this series. It's just something that you know reiterates the theme, captures students' attention, motivates them a little bit more. But it's all based on this idea that, yeah, students today, they, uh, the telephone, the telephone is part of their body, really, and so they're using it all the time. So maybe the textbook should reflect that. So a new series does that. So the key topic is personal, personal flexible learning, personalized flexible learning. And what does that include? Well, I've sort of divided this into four different, uh, four different areas. The first one is being able to make some flexible choices, some different choices in what you're doing in the classroom. Too often we think we don't have many choices. We open the book on, you know, Monday morning on the first day of class on page one, and then we just keep turning the pages for a whole semester, and then hopefully the semester and the book finish at the same time. But actually we always have a lot more choices than that in terms of the materials. And of course, how we teach, uh, what the students do, what the students' assessments are, how they show what they know, different things like that. Um, it's important for teachers to have a lot of support, uh, extensive support. And uh, the reason why teachers need a lot of support is because, as I mentioned, students are changing. They have different needs. Students today are a little bit than, uh, different than students five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And for those of you who are uh, older, like me, uh, of course, much different than when we learned English at first point or our first or our second language, whatever that was. So maybe they're learning for different reasons and they want to learn in different ways, especially with technology. And so teachers need some guidance on how to make that possible. How can we do that in the best possible way? The third one is personalized approaches. And this is something I think that is very, very different uh, today than it was even 10 or 20 years ago. Now we sort of expect and students expect for learning to be much more personalized. We used to think that everyone should learn the same things. Everyone needs to learn the identical English. And this is still the case in many things like standardized tests. We test everybody on everything. And the basic problem with most tests is we ask the wrong question. What do I mean? What do, what do I mean by the wrong question? Well, we're generally asking the question, the question that we're asking is, you know, do you know what I know? Do you know what I know? That is, you know, I've been teaching you for uh, a, a semester and, uh, you know, I've told you 1,000 things and now I'm going to give you a test on 10 things, something like that. It's typically how we teach and how we assess. But really the question we should be asking is, what do you know? And how can you show me what you know? Those are the more important questions because, you know, uh, you can all go to the same class and you all have different ideas and different opinions. Just the same way when you go to a movie with friends, you all walk out talking about different parts of it that you liked or that you, uh, that you, was, you, or that you didn't like, uh, things that illustrate you understood some things and maybe didn't understand others. And that's what all those discussions are all about after you have what should be a shared experience where you should go into a movie and come out with the identical ideas and opinions, but we know you don't. 
And the same is true in the classroom. We all think differently. All our students think differently after they walk out of the classroom. So again, the question of personalized approaches is giving them the chance to think about, you know, what, what it means to them and to internalize the information that we are trying to share because it is meaningful to them in some way. And the final one is flipped learning. Flipped learning, what is that? Okay, so many of you are probably already familiar with flipped learning, and many of you will have all, all used flipped learning to a small degree or large degree in your classrooms. If you haven't heard of flipped learning or you haven't used it, don't worry, you will. <laughs> it is, I would say, the number one trend in education today. It is the number one thing that's changing cl how classrooms are taught. And basically, it's shifting responsibility uh, from the teachers to the learners. And it's ensuring that more of the learning is done outside of the class. And classroom time is focused much more on having uh, students show what they know, giving them the opportunities, for example, to use language, not just to learn about language. Okay, so we'll talk about each of these in turn. And let's start off with the first one. We'll start off with flexible choices, and then we'll go through the others. So the first one, flexible choices, as I mentioned, you have a lot of power in your classrooms. When that door closes, you sort of are your own, you're in charge, you can do what you want for the most part. So what are those flexible choices that you have when you are in the classroom? Well, uh, we need, uh, part of the question is, well, not only do you have flexible choices in a teaching style, which we don't talk about enough. Everyone has a different teaching style. We talk about learning styles all the time, but why not teaching styles? It's because we expect teachers to teach the same, but I think that's rubbish. I think that's silly. I think that every, every teacher teaches a little bit differently. And again, when you think about your own educations, when you were going to school, there was a teacher that you absolutely loved. You thought it was the best teacher, but your best friend, your best friend hated that teacher and said, well, how can that be? You know, the teacher's the same, but your personalities are different. It's often because each teacher has a style and that appeals to some, uh, to some students in different ways. Um, there's uh, uh, my uh, my sons have studied piano for many years and 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 uh, we've had many different teachers and one of the teachers was very very awful. She actually hit the children with a ruler on their fingers when they made mistakes and everything else. And we took him out. We took him out. But the other parents loved her. She thought and other students loved her. She they just thought she was the best and she really motivated the students. Anyway, it was just all different but we have te different teaching styles. So what are some of the variables? What are some of the variables that force us to have different teaching styles, that force us to encounter essentially what are problems? Well, the first one is not enough contact hours or time to cover the course book content. It's one of the number one things that I hear from many, many teachers. They say, well, I'd love to do more, but I'm always running out of time. There never seems to be enough time. And of course, because I work a lot with textbooks, they're always saying, ah, we can only do eight of the 10 units in the book. We can't use the whole book or something. So that's one issue. The second one is that they often, teachers often talk to me about, and I should say that um, I also teach uh, graduate students and doctoral students, they're all teachers, so many of the things that they talk about uh, are they're more able and less able learners. Now, fine, give me a whole class of more able learners, easy. Give me a whole class of less able learners, still easy. But when you mix them all together, uh, sometimes that can be quite challenging. So that's an issue for many teachers. Um, the third one is a lack of personal expertise. You know, as teachers, uh, we don't feel that we're quite ever uh, perfect enough. We don't know everything. And there's always seems to be some new issue that comes up. Uh, I remember one for me when I was younger is uh, somebody said, oh, yes, well, you know, my son is dyslexic. And this was years and years ago when I was still teaching secondary school, right? So, uh, uh, and I thought, oh, dyslexic. I know that word, but what does that mean exactly? So I had to go look it up and find out more. And then I had to think about how to help a student who had dyslexia. And in fact, a dyslexia is often being unable to read a sentence simply because 
the letters almost seem to be in motion, sometimes upside down or backwards or whatever, but they just don't recognize those symbols in the same way. The biggest challenge with something like that is that you have to realize that is not a sign of a lack of intelligence. It's just a, it's just a medical condition about how people perceive the world. So lack of personal expertise, we're constantly learning. And then a last one is class sizes. And uh, this class size is an interesting one. And of course, I know you're probably thinking, yes, yes, my class is too big, or there's so many students in my class. But sometimes it's not that. Sometimes the class size problem is when there are too few students. That can create problems as well. Let's talk about all of these things together. So the first problem, not enough contact hours or time to cover the course book content. So how do we deal with this? Um, well, I think that we have to break the problem down a little bit and look at it in some different ways. So first of all, with contact hours, contact hours, the biggest thing is to get students, uh, learners working outside of class, working outside of class in some way. So whenever there's, uh, whenever you, because we often say there's not enough time in the language classroom to learn a language. The students who are most uh, efficient and most able to learn a language, you know, make an effort outside of class, not just to uh, not just to study more, which of course is great, but also to try to learn the language. And you say, oh, sorry, but I live in, you know, I don't know, I live in Colombia or something. I, I they can't use English, and I think, well, that's nonsense. There's always somebody else to speak English to, if 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 only another student in the class. But usually, there's many opportunities to speak English, and there's all always opportunities to read in English and to listen to English programs online and so on and so forth. So a big thing about contact hours is finding ways to get learners uh, working outside of class. Now this, uh, to go back to this series, just because I want to continue to give you some examples of how this is practical, is the new startup series has uh, has with it uh, an app, a phone app. And so, you know, the students always have their phones with them and there's extra practice on that, as well as all the videos and audio files from each unit. So they can download those, it's included, it's free when you, when you get the series. So they, uh, they can use those outside of class to extend that learning time. And the same is true with time to cover the course book content. Again, teachers often say, oh, I don't have time to go through this, you know, every unit. And I think, well, that's mostly a time management problem. Sometimes, of course, you only see students, you know, for a very short time, maybe just two hours a week. Well, yes, it's hard to get through a whole book if you're seeing them two, two hours a week. But, uh, but again, what we have to do is uh, often is to focus on the learning objectives, the learning objectives. What are they supposed to learn? Not the pages. Now, this is a difficult one because uh, students and their parents often as well, they think, oh, but you have to finish the whole book or you haven't finished everything in the book. Uh, but in fact, you have to think about what's the learning objectives and find different ways to cover those. Maybe you can cover them more efficiently or more effectively in some ways. Um, what are some other variables? Uh, more and less able learners we talked about. Um, there's the famous story about the tortoise and the hare or the uh, turtle and the rabbit and they have a race and the, the, the rabbit goes so far ahead that he thinks, oh, I can, uh, I can take a rest. So he has a little sleep, but as he's sleeping, the, the, the turtle, you know, crawls past him and wins the race. So I think this is a good metaphor in some ways for looking at the idea, looking at the idea of uh, learners. Um, there's a couple of variables about learners that we need to be able to consider. One is that learners are not always less able or more able in all skills. Often, maybe students are very, very good at speaking and listening, but maybe they're not so good at reading and writing. So it's seldom that you find students really, really good in all four skills and many other aspects of learning a language, right? In some cases, like the turtle, uh, they can finish the race, but they just need a little bit more time. Um, I think, you know, my, my wife, my wife calls me a slow learner, right? Because I, I sometimes, I, I really like to take my time to figure out how to do something and I take longer. But once I learn it, I learn it like everyone else. But it was just a, a bit of a slow learner. So some people need more time and that's okay. But in the classroom, if we're doing a cycle of teach, you know, teach, assess, teach, assess, teach, assess, then, you know, students don't have the time 
to learn something. So that's a bit of a problem. So we need to give them more time. Um, in many cases, uh, the difference between more able and less able learners is simply confidence, having some confidence. Uh, some students, you know, when you ask a, a question in the class and you say, hands up, you know, who knows this? And everybody puts up their hands, except some students. Are they, do they really not know the answer? Or maybe they just don't have confidence. They don't have the confidence to speak about the answer. So they may need more confidence. So that's a sort of an issue that we need to concern ourselves with as well. So these are some variables around more able and less able learners. And they're not the only ones, but this is just some examples of things. What other variables do we have? Well, again, I mentioned this idea of a lack of personal expertise and congratulations to everybody here today because of course you're coming to improve your expertise a little bit. You're trying to pick up a couple of practical ideas or, or theoretical ideas, something that's gonna be useful for you in your own classrooms in some way. That's fantastic. So personal expertise is, can be divided into many different aspects though. Of course, you just need to know the answers to the questions. So fortunately, a series like Startup comes with an excellent, excellent uh, teacher's book. I've done lots of the work on that as well. Uh, but it starts off with answers. You know, the answers, of course, so you don't have to look it up. The methods, but how do you teach some things? Because again, most of us, when, when I talked about this last last week in the in the issue, uh, in, the, in the presentation, the webinar about goals, I mentioned that many of us are influenced by, by those uh, teachers that we had. So sometimes our methods are a little bit old and we tend to teach the way we were taught. So that can be an issue. So you were looking for some new methods. Um, solutions to problems um, because uh, we often face a variety of problems in the classroom and a good series uh, like Startup, you know, the teacher's edition provides those solutions for, for, for you. Um, cultural notes is another interesting one because learning a language uh, it often is challenging because of the differences in how things are, you know, how you understand things and what the differences between your own culture and someone else's. So cultural notes are kind of important to understand uh, English. Even for native English speakers, I was thinking about this uh, expression, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, and we do fingers crossed for good luck. Uh, but I also think that when you're lying, when you're lying, we say you put your fingers, cross your fingers behind your back and you, you say something and it means that you're lying about it. So it's kind of an interesting uh, idiom, fingers crossed. So uh, things like cultural notes can maybe explain some of those things and explain the differences in how language is actually used. We often say that uh, language is culture, language is culture, really you can't separate them. And then the other thing that's important for teachers to have are tailoring options. How do you tailor the learning for your own classroom, for your own country, for your own, you know, for your own culture, for your own uh, needs of particular students? You know, as those opportunities to tailor the learning are extremely important. Okay, um, the last of these is uh, the class sizes. Is your class sizes large or are they small, right? This is actually a stadium, I think you guessed that. But uh, imagine having so many students, right? Um, I, the largest class that I've ever taught, I've given presentations to, I think at, uh, I think about 3,500 people, I gave a presentation once, but, uh, but then I was in China, uh, just 1,500 people in the audience, but they videotaped it. And, and uh, they were video, and I thought they were just making a, bit, a movie. And then they say, no, 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 the, the online audience loved it. And I said, oh, I said, how many people were watching online? They say 40, 40,000, 40,000, so that was a very large class, but unlike most classes, you don't have to deal with them all in one room, and you don't have to deal with, a, you know, basically uh, tailoring to individual needs for all of them. You speak generally, and no, there's no expectation that you're going to have to deal with all the problems of students individually. But large, uh, large classes and small classes can each have their challenges. Um, is the classroom sometimes the problem? Sometimes it's not so much the number of students. And I know uh, I've asked my own graduate students in Colombia, I said, how many students do you have? I think the most that uh, they said, one student said 55. I said 55. And I think he was teaching maybe in a primary or secondary school. I can't remember now, 55. 
unbelievable. I said, I thought that was so amazing. I said, why some, I said, that seems wrong. I said, why aren't you doing something else? He said, he said, professor, I'm the only teacher. He said, if I don't take those, all those students into my class, they don't go to school. I thought, oh, wow. So again, here you see the dedication. But uh, sometimes the problem is the classroom. Uh, it's not just that there's so many students, but they're so tightly together. There's no room to move. You can maybe do some pair work, but you can't stand up and do any group discussion or anything like that. Sometimes it's motivation, uh, because if you're not motivating the students or the students are not finding motivation themselves, because really it should be their job, not your job, to be motivated. They should be coming to class ready to learn. Sometimes if they're not motivated, then they're disruptive, then they are misbehaving in the classroom, and that can pr create problems. Sometimes noise is a problem with large classrooms, not for you necessarily, because learning a language should be noisy. It should be something where students are excited and they're using the language on and, and so on and so forth but noise can be a problem often for other classrooms or you know the principal comes and director comes and knocks on the door and says please please a little quieter but it, actually a quiet class is not a language classroom so then maybe you should think okay maybe I should do something in another room or move move my students right sometimes there are other problems as well with different class sizes and I mentioned small ones sometimes being a problem uh, interesting study that was done because many private schools, they always say, oh, we have very small classes, very small classes. But actually there was a study that was done that looked at small classes and they found out that in very small classes, sometimes there's a problem because one student will dominate the discussion over and over and over again. So fewer students get a chance to share their opinions or, or say anything at all. So that can be a problem as well in small classes. But I think most of us would prefer small classes. Anyway, let's we'll see. Okay, among these we can sort of see uh, two, two key factors. One is that learners learn at different paces and they have different strengths, right? So this, this just this general idea. They learn at different paces, some faster, some slower, and they will have different strengths. Some will be more able in some skills and less able in, in other skills. Even the ones who are least able might remember it the longest. So it's just, again, it's not a, it's not a guarantee. And the second of these two key factors is for many reasons, teachers need to focus on some skills uh, more than others. So this is another challenge that we face is that we think that, uh, you know, maybe our students are very good at reading, but they're not very good at speaking and listening. Uh, maybe they're not very good at writing or they need more. They need more work just on listening. You know, you, you, don't, you don't know. You have to work it out. And for each class, it might be a little bit different. So again, this is one of the reasons why teachers do need to become flexible in some ways. So they need flexible choices to address the challenges. Um, we have to address, uh, assess the needs of the students and we have to adapt to each class in some way. And uh, I often need to think about the idea of a, of a toolbox, right? Uh, uh, your, your teaching materials and uh, everything that you use in the classroom is like your toolbox. You're trying to solve problems and build things, yeah? So let's go on and we'll continue on with some of these ideas and, and I'll revisit some of those as I go through other parts that this naturally leads into the idea of extensive support. We say that we need a lot of support for teachers in, in different ways. And in fact, we all need some kind of help, right? So here's our friend Harry Houdini again. Um, you know, he needs some help from some police officers to stand up, I guess. Uh, but we all need help in the classroom. I do, I do. I, I push myself into situations where we always, it's like uh, Lev Vygotsky's, you know, the zone of proximal development. There's things I can do quite easily and quite well. And there's things that I'll never be able to do maybe. And right in between are some things that I would like to do that I'm pushing myself towards. Uh, for example, I had to teach a course on educational statistics very, very difficult for me, even though I used to be a math teacher when I was younger, uh, but very, very difficult for me to do that. And so we all need a certain amount of help. Um, Startup, the series that we're talking about, supports teachers and learners in many, many different ways. It's important to give them a lot of support. Um, the biggest one is that the book is designed in such a way that you can open it and just start teaching. So now I realize that some of you are not teaching adults, some of you are teaching secondary school students, and the Startup series is aimed at young adults and, and adults. 
Um, but even if you're teaching primary school students or elementary or, or teenagers, it's all the same. It's all the same. You're looking for these same things. You should be able to open the book and to start teaching. Um, uh, the startup series is teacher friendly. And this made friendly by clear rubrics and lots of visual support and by offering many different resources. Um, this also has to be a high degree of modeling. So again, if you're looking for a textbook series, it's something you have to look for. How easy is it for students to understand what they are supposed to do? Of course, you can always tell them, but then sometimes you're not so sure yourself. So modeling is a kind of a really interesting and useful thing that we need to be able to put into uh, our teaching and learning materials. So fortunately, the teacher's edition is filled with tips and suggestions, and I already mentioned some of these, the things like cultural notes and, and solutions to different types of problems that you commonly face, and flexible learning opportunities, different ways you might teach the same materials, right? So the third, the third area gets us into this uh, personalized approaches. So with personalized approaches, we're really trying to think, again, how is every student different instead of trying to think that every student is the same? Again, a lot of our education system was based on you know, training people to go into factories, training them to go into the army, training them to go into, you know, large group organizations and all do the same job. But we realize today that actually we can't, we don't have that expectation that everyone will have the same job. In fact, we expect that most people will grow up and not just have different jobs, but they will have many different jobs. And so, Everybody has some personal strengths and they have to make use of those personal strengths when they get into uh, some area of employment of some kind. So learners need opportunities to each achieve their best. It's just a bottom line thing that we agree with now that we tend to think about. We have to think, how can every learner achieve uh, his or her best. Again, we don't expect them all that everyone is going to be, you know, uh, Albert Einstein or, you know, or, or some famous, you know, wealthy person, Mark Zuckerberg, anything like that. But we just want them to achieve what they can achieve and give them the opportunities to do that. And again, even within language, even within learning a language, we recognize that some students, you know, may never be, you know, excellent, excellent speakers of English, but they may be great readers. They might like read and enjoy that. And uh, they, may, they might be, you know, turn into, they might be shy about speaking, but they may be, turn out to be, you know, great writers of English. I think about the uh, writer Joseph Conrad. He was, uh, he was born in Poland, he grew up learning Polish, and he learned English late in life. But then when he started writing his many Nobel Prize winning novels, he, he wrote in English, you know. So uh, again, learning just to be your best for what you can do. How do personalized approaches help? Well, learners have many different academic, uh, academic, social, and professional English needs. I talked about this a little bit last week, and I'll just say it again. Um, so, of course, you know, if they're studying a course, they need a certain amount of academic English just to, you know, just to get through a course very well and particularly to you know, address the needs of uh, testing and things like writing essays and the things that are expected in an academic area and reports, other sorts of things that you have to write. Uh, and also how to debate and discuss things, you know, in, in academic settings, uh, make a presentation, all of those sorts of things. They're all academic. But there's also social and professional English needs as well. So professional English needs are probably closer to academic needs in many cases because you have to do a lot of the same things. You go into a meeting in your in an office and you don't call it a debate or something, but it is, it is a debate. It is a situation in which you have an opinion or a set of ideas, you've done your research, you want to argue for something and somebody else is gonna be listening carefully and maybe your boss and the other people are gonna be arguing for something else and your boss is gonna be judging and uh, making a decision based on that. And of course, if he decides on your, your presentation, then that's great for you. Then you feel a little bit better about yourself and who knows, maybe you get a promotion. So we don't call it a debate, but a lot of the things are quite similar to the things that happen in academic English. But there are other things that you do that are purely professional, job applications. So uh, startup features, job applications and uh, interview techniques and things like that. Those are all important for that. 
but in between the two, in between the two and overlapping the two are social, our social English uh, needs. So what do we mean by social English needs? Well, a very big part of any relationship that you have in school or in the workplace has to do with how well you get along with other people. And as, a, as an employee or as a boss, you re really always want to try to get along with other people. And that's done through social English. That's the chit chat. That's the, uh, we used to call it the water cooler conversations, right? So everyone would go, go to the water cooler or to the, or to the place where they have coffee and they would sit around or stand around and chat for a little bit there. It's social, but it actually ends up influencing your success academically because you can work with others in a group. Uh, in professional settings, exactly the same. It's going to improve your standing in a professional setting. Um, learners appreciate some control over their learning in terms of, uh, um, so, oh, sorry. So basically academic, social, and professional English, each student is gonna have some different needs. Most of our students may be going to different jobs. You may be fortunate, you may be just teaching English for engineers or English for accountants or something, then that's great. Then maybe they're all very together and very similar. But very often what we do is we end up teaching students who are going into different fields, academically and professionally, and they're all in the same English class. So we need some, uh, we need to personalize it for their interests. The second point is learners appreciate some control over their own learning. They like to personalize their learning because then they can say, okay, these things are very, very important for me. I need to be able to say this in English. And these are topics that I will want to be able to discuss and sound quite competent in. And it may be because they have some personal experience in some other area. So uh, my son, he's studying international economics like you know, all the other students in his class but he's also doing some computer programming. So he's developing an app he wants to think. So that's great. So he's working on that. So fantastic. So again, that might be something that he wants to talk about in another language as well. And all of this is important because control leads to responsibility. If students have a little more control over what they're learning, they start questioning, you know, uh, why, what do I need to learn? Too often the question in the classroom is, teacher, why are we learning this? And that's a terrible, terrible question. And the question that we really want is, you know, uh, how should I learn? How should I learn? What should I be learning? You know, and, and make them more responsible for those sorts of questions. So there's lots of goals and opportunities there. Um, and goals and opportunities help to uh, point students towards something. Now, last week I spoke about goals, so I'm not gonna go all over those points. But uh, every teacher enters the classroom with goals. We have goals, uh, most of them are recommended and they're, they're recommended by you know, the, uh, the school or the school board, something like that. Um, some are, uh, and, and also the textbooks have them. Some are personal goals because you're, you have very specific interests for your students and some are discovered. You see problems with students and then you think, oh, how can I solve this problem with this particular student? And I mentioned earlier, this idea of when I first encountered students with dyslexia. I've also taught students who are blind. Um, quite challenging. It was, a, it was a new thing for me. A student just showed up. Nobody told me they were coming into the classroom. It was, I was going to have a blind student. But then as soon as they were, I tried to do, what can I do to help you? You know, so that was an interesting one. Now, one thing that helps a lot with uh, actually all Pearson courses, but, the, uh, but especially with Startup, because it's such a new course, is the global scale of English, which is closely aligned to the uh, common European framework, but has much more detail, much more detail. Uh, there are many more objectives. It has, it's more granular, we say. So instead of just having the scale of, you know, A1, uh, A2, B1, B2, B2+, plus, things like that, it has from 10 to 90. So you can get right in the middle and say, I'm a 40, seven or I'm a 48, you know, this is whatever the goals are. So the goals are, are the GSE system works very, very well together and it starts with this scale from 10 to 90. Uh, you can set very specific learning obje objectives using it. Uh, the course materials, you know, adopt these uh, learning objectives and then the tests, uh, the Pearson test of English and other tests uh, in the Pearson uh, testing regime, uh, they all, they can, the whole system basically can idea 
before they take a test if whether or not they're likely to pass. So that's great, right? So there's the GSC Teacher Toolkit. It's free, it's online, and it's included with Startup as well. There's a link to it in the portal. You can go to this sort of thing. And then uh, it's very simple. You choose either language skills or communicative categories. Language skills, of course, listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Uh, communicative categories, though, are also interesting. Uh, comprehension, forms of communication, and you can see by that little arrow there, there's lots of sub, sub points that you can hit on. Uh, language functions, linguistics competence, meeting practical needs and strategies. So all these different ones, you choose whatever you want. So say if you choose something like adult learners, you choose as a skill um, uh, listening and you choose an area Results. Fantastic, right? So the first one says, can understand advice and instructions for resolving a problem uh, with a product or a piece of equipment. It's a listening skill. It's at GSE 55. It's B1 plus, shows me exactly where it is. So, and again, there's a lot more detail. Once you click on to this, it gives you a lot more detail about each objective. Thank you. So, actually for under for students understanding what they want to do and for you understanding what students should be doing um, there's an enormous amount of support but you might think uh, you might think well that seems like too much work you know i don't have time to do all that i'm already teaching so many hours a week but don't worry this is actually you know all of this is just to show you what has already gone into a series like startup they put all these objectives in there and they're organized by levels so that it's pushing the students a little bit at each time but it's uh, but it's again oriented towards the level that they should be at for the global scale of english and the cefr as well so it just sort of does it all for them but again if you're always ever curious or you want to go deep deeper and you want to understand something better you can do that you can go back and forth with that yourself. Some sections focusing on the learners, um, uh, make it personal, it's found throughout the, th throughout the startup series, it's a very big part of it. So making it personal is extremely important um, and uh, as is the media projects which I've mentioned before as well. So the media projects is a way of assessing students uh, alternatively. Uh, so you can assess them by doing this media project. They have to use everything that they've learned in the unit so far, but then at the very end of it, they can demonstrate that by putting together a little video or a set of photographs and talking about them and having that evaluated by their peers. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for teachers also to be flexible in terms of rearranging the lessons or sending some of the lessons to be, you know, for some groups to work on some things while you work with other groups on others. So again, for those more able and less able students, it's a great way to divide up a book. It doesn't, you don't just don't have to go through one unit and deal with everything sequentially. You can break it up in some different ways and of course assign some for homework. So this takes us to the fourth and last issue that we want to talk about today, which is flipped learning. So it's time, really time to rethink the classroom organization. You know, uh, again, just to re for, re restate that there's not enough time in the language classroom to learn a language. We have to do some different things or think about it differently. Um, uh, fortunately, Startup is a series that do, uh, allows for that, allows for that quite well. There's a wealth of resources, a lot of different kinds of resources that students can, you know, learn in class or on their own at home or actually anywhere where they are. This guy's obviously sitting in an airplane. You, you can learn, you know, when you're sitting on the bus, uh, if you just want to use your app and look at that. So class time is an opportunity, as I said at the very beginning, for learners to share and practice what they've learned. So they come with questions to classroom, not just, uh, not just coming to classroom with, you know, so, oh, what are we doing today, teacher? So you can choose. Flipped learning is all about a personal choice. So you can decide what you want to do in class and what learners should do outside of class on their own. So obviously, typically, that's going to be more reading and writing activities outside of class, more speaking and listening inside of class, more preparation inside of class, and more demonstration of what they've learned uh, inside of class at the end as well. So you can use class time, as I said, for the preparation tasks that introduce the content of each lesson. Uh, you may focus on the listening and speaking tasks in particular, because of course it's a great opportunity there to use that a little bit more. 
But that doesn't mean that all the listening and speaking is done in class. In fact, they should be practicing their listening and speaking outside of class using the various resources that are available to them. Reading and writing tasks and media projects can be done outside of class. The media projects are always done outside of class. And how much is up to you? You can decide. You might decide, well, we have lots of time in class. Let's do some of the writing here and we'll do a little bit and I'll help you a little bit. I'll help you or I'll work with some different uh, learners. Uh, but you might decide, you might decide that, no, where time is tight, I wanna focus on listening and speaking. Please do the reading and writing outside of class. Um, I mentioned before the grammar, the extensive grammar that's available in startup, but the important aspect of this is that there's seven different ways of learning grammar. Uh, the student book has its own lessons, then there's practice tasks at the back, the grammar coach videos, there's active teach, uh, the Pearson practice app, that telephone app that we mentioned, there's handouts, and uh, the handouts have um, uh, of two kinds, just basic grammar, uh, but there's also inductive grammar, where you, uh, the inductive grammar means it presents the language and then you have to figure out what are the rules there, so it's a different way of teaching it. Um, there's also pronunciation coach videos and conversation videos and audios, and those actually help a little bit with the grammar as well, but again, they're just separate sorts of things, but there's lots going on. So what do we have? What do we have? In the end, we have these four different areas which um, help to make help to make learning uh, in general more flexible and with startup in particular helps to make it a lot more flexible. Uh, first of all, just making some flexible choices yourself, deciding what you want to do in class, when you want to do it, how you're going to teach it, what's your teaching style, what are some other things, and startup helps with that, with extensive support, which is the second one. Teachers shouldn't just be expected to go ahead and teach everything. They can't be expected to know everything. You start off as a novice teacher, you know, just out of university, and, you know, a lot of things are new, and you need time to sort of adapt to those. Um, a series like Startup through its teacher's editions give you a lot of extensive support there. There's personalized approaches are important in the classroom, we realize, because students are all different. They're all a little bit different and they need some different approaches. Uh, so we have to personalize the teaching of these students. And that starts with really asking students what they want to learn. What do they need to learn? Where are they going to use English? And again, the whole idea is always about building that, that student responsibility. And finally, flipped learning is an easy way to sort of do something to move, to give yourself more time in the classroom, which is one of the principal problems we, st we started with. You know, there's not enough time in the classroom, there's not enough time to finish the course book. Well, there is if you use flipped learning because you can focus on the things that need to be done in class. And if it doesn't need to be done in class, you, you can ask students to do it outside. You say, oh my goodness, but teacher, they, you know, they barely do their homework now. Well, you know, still, you have to make an effort. You start with baby steps, you start a little bit small. And again, if the student's objective is really to learn the language, either for use throughout their lives, or even if they're just thinking, I only wanna use this to pass the test, either way, you can show them that they're going to do, uh, do so much more easily with flipped learning. So these are all things. I just want to leave you with one final thing. Um, this was uh, Harry Houdini again. And I was, when I was reading about him in the preparation for this, he said, my chief task has been to conquer fear, right? So here he is, you can see he's on an airplane somewhere up in the air, I guess, and, uh, and uh, he's being flying and he's probably tied up there or something. I'm not sure what he's doing exactly. But uh, my chief task has been to conquer fear. I think that's true. I, I like that because I think it's very true for many of us teachers as well. We have to conquer own, our own fear, our own insecurities, our own challenges that we have in the classroom, our own feelings that oh, maybe I'm not good enough or I don't know enough here. And we have to find ways to do that. And also our students need to do this as well. They need to overcome their fear of learning a language. So it's a challenging task, but we know with the right help they can do it. Okay, questions, comments, suggestions, anything from anyone? Yeah. Thank you, Ken. That was um, amazing. I really enjoy it. Um, um, as teachers, we need to make our students responsible for their learning, and that's something that they need to know from the very beginning. Um, we have several questions here, and we have greetings from Ukraine, from Mexico, from Argentina. Um, 
people thanking you for everything. And well, the first question we have here is the following. What if my problems in the classroom are unique? For example, I have some students with learning disability. How can I help this student? Okay, very, very interesting. Well, actually, that relates very much to what I had to say about this uh, student that I had with dyslexia and also the students that I had that were blind. Um, part of the issue is to realize that, you know, if students have learning disabilities, they're not learning at the same rate or the same way as everyone else. And that's really where you have to tailor the learning. So you have to go back and you have to think, well, what are the learning objectives? So what, uh, what do the students have to be able to do? Uh, and of course, you want to get them through the course, uh, but you have to think, what are the learning objectives, not just is there a particular, you know, are they on page 13 of the textbook? So again, going back to the students sometimes is the, is the good thing, or, you know, if they have a lot of disabilities, if they're not adults, if they're younger, going back to their parents and to other teachers and to talking to them and say, what do you think are some good solutions here? And how can I do, how can I give them some success? Because that's what we want to do with all of our students because that builds their confidence if they can have some success. So if you do have students with some learning disabilities, don't separate them. Try to keep them in the class with the other students and also look for opportunities where you can say, oh yes, you know, Charles has the answer. Charles, tell us and, and, and give that student uh, an opportunity to show off to build their confidence as well. They face greater challenges, uh, but sometimes they work harder as well. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we have a second question um, and it's about the same, um, the same topic. My more able students don't want to work with the less able ones. They think it's okay. a waste of time. Um, does this new uh, series start up? explain as well how to um, use flip learning and when to use oh. it well those are two different questions I'm sorry. okay two different questions let me take them one at a time and then i'll ask for this third question again okay so the 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 uh the idea of more able students not wanting to work with less able ones it's so common and you know any of you who have older brothers and sisters or younger brothers and sisters you probably know the same thing i'm the youngest of five yeah my brother never wanted to help me or something like that my mother said help your brother he said i don't want to he can't do it right and of course you know <laughs> that changes over time but but it's the same it's the same thing that happens in the classroom is they don't see the advantage and as teachers, what we have to do is show them the advantage. Now, the advantage, of course, is that when you teach something, you learn it better. And also, you know, you give it, you give the more able students appreciation. You have to take them aside beforehand, say, hey, listen, you already know this. I don't want to waste your time teaching it again and again. I think you, you're going to be bored if I do this. So uh, I really want you to help some of the other students to bring them up to your level. You know, then we can move forward together much more. So uh, give them some advantages, show them that and show them the recognition that you appreciate that. And uh, they will feel good because, of course, they'll go in and say, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, they'll go home and they say, oh, I'm helping this weaker student, you know, because uh, they need my help or something. And they'll feel good about that, I think. Yeah. So that's OK. And the third question, sorry, can you give that to me again? Yes. Yes. Um, about startup. Does this uh, new series uh, explain how to flip learning and when to use oh. it? Yes, it does, actually. Yeah, it's um, in a couple of different ways. The, the uh, the student, the teacher's edition has information on flipping learning and suggestions on how to do that. But there's also, I just finished, I just finished writing two scripts for videos. So they're making short little videos, just five minutes on how to flip learning. And it shows you very practically. First of all, the first video is what is flipped learning? And it explains that. And then the second video uh, is shows you with one unit. It takes you through one unit to show what you can flip and what you might just want to do in class. And again, it's a very flexible approach. You can do what you want. It's not that you have to do it one particular way. Yeah, so it's there. Ken and Lorena is asking about the GSC. Uh, for the teachers that are not using this series, can we enter the GSE teacher kit? Absolutely. It's called the, it's called the teacher toolkit. And if you just type in, if you just go to GSE, uh, type in global scale of English, 
toolkit, uh, you'll get there. And yes, you can use it yourself for anything. It's completely free. There's so many resources there and you can tailor it for young learners, for uh, adults, for academic learners, uh, for all sorts of things. So I really encourage you to investigate it because it's very useful, yeah. Now, what about your take on um, sleep learning? Um, Ray talks about some students working, taking care of children, and they might not have the time to do much work at home. Um, and this makes flip learning difficult. Ah, yeah, it, it's a good point. Uh, it's a good point. It does take more time at home, but again, you know, even if you have children, I have children, I know. I know that everybody has some time. You have some time. There's time when you're taking the bus or time when you put the kids to bed or when they're having a nap or you're early in the morning. And I know it's difficult with children, but uh, you know, if you're serious about learning a language, you have to make the time. And maybe that means giving up, you know, watching some TV or doing something else that you'd love to do. And when you're really uh, having to put more time into it. And the big advantage of startup is in the app. Uh, when you have the app, it's so dedicated to each uh, unit that you can keep up with what's going on in the unit and extend your learning. And of course, you can do that in three minutes, five minutes. Um, my, uh, my publisher, Irene Frankel, is a very wise, uh, experienced teacher and, uh, and editor, but she, uh, she talks about vocabulary sprints. Sprints, you know, when you have a 100-yard dash or race or something like that. But she said, you know, encourage students to do sprints uh, of learning their vocabulary, learning grammar, learning, going through flashcards. And it's more important to do many small sprints than it is to say, okay, I need three hours to study right now. That's not as effective. So just finding a little bit of time, yeah, each day. 